Today we are going to speak about taxonomy. Open your books at page 10, look at the picture of Carl Linnaeus and his diagram and say please. Which of these seven classifications are used in the scientific name of a living organism? You see they are genus and species. And let's read definition of taxonomy. It is the branch of science concerned with classification especially of organism. The aim of taxonomy is to describe and organize life forms. Now open your vocabularies and write down new words. Listen and repeat. Attribute Binomial Classify Equate Equate to Genus Harbor Invalid Invertebrate Optical lens Taxonomist Vertebrate now let's watch the video and read the text. What's in a name? Did you know that Huso Huso, Panthera uncia and Aquila nipalensis are all species native to Kazakhstan? Perhaps you know these animals better by their common names. The beluga sturgeon, the snow leopard and the steppe eagle. Have you ever wondered about the origin of these scientific names? It dates all the way back to Aristotle in ancient Greece. Aristotle created the field of taxonomy to describe and organize life forms. The word comes from the ancient Greek words taxis, meaning arrangement, and nomia, meaning method. Early taxonomy was based on the type of organism, a plant, an animal, a bird, or a fish, and a description of its characteristics. Aristotle began to classify living organisms based on their attributes, such as giving birth to live young, laying eggs and having blood or not having blood. These attributes roughly equate to the categories mammals, non-mammals, vertebrates and invertebrates that we use today. Theophrastus, a student of Aristotle's, went on to name around 500 plants and their uses in Historia Plantarum, and as a result came to be known as the father of botany. In the 18th century, Carl Linnaeus, a Swedish botanist, became the father of modern taxonomy. He changed the way organisms were classified using their class, order, genus and species, which came to be known as the Linnaean system. He also introduced a standardized binomial naming system in the 18th century using a two-part scientific name made up of the genus and a name for that particular species. Today, almost every organism on our planet has a scientific name. However, there are still some places that harbor unknown species, such as the depths of our oceans and our unexplored forests and jungles. Exercise two. You are to read the text again and answer the questions. Why is Aristotle called the father of science? You see, he created the field of taxonomy to describe and organize life forms. What name did Theophrastus earn for himself? The father of botany. Why were more detailed observations possible during the Renaissance? because optical lenses were invented then. What did John Ray publish and when? Methodist Plantarum Nova in 1682. What happened to the original names of organisms after the Linnaean system was introduced? All the old names became invalid. Now let's work with vocabulary. You are to complete the summary using the words from the box. For example, the first attempt to classify and name living organisms date back to ancient Greece. Write down this exercise in your copy books. Exercise 4 is devoted to grammar, pre- and post-modifying noun structures. Let's watch the theory. Nouns can have a variety 
of pre-modifiers, one or more nouns together, for example, journal, article, university, sports center, a noun to describe what material something is made of, a metal instrument, a noun ending in ing, for example, a funding problem, a measurement of weight, distance, age, and etc. For example, a 2 kilogram box, a 20 kilometer run, a 5 year old boy, and so on. Nouns can also have post modifiers. A prepositional phrase, for example, a system with seven categories, or a relative clause, an animal which gives birth to live young. Now let's find and identify the modifying noun structures below. I'll meet you outside the university laboratory. We see it indicates something as a part of something else. We saw some of Linnea's notebooks in a glass case at the museum. Here it is described what material is case made of. She is done a two-year course in biology. It's a measurement. I bought a new drawing book yesterday, a noun ending in ing. Linus invented a system which revolutionized taxonomy. We see system which revolutionized a relative clause. In exercise 5, you are to listen to two friends discussing plant taxonomy. For questions from 1 to 4, choose the correct answer. Hi, Lauren. Those are beautiful flowers. Who gave them to you? Hi, Jamie. No one gave them to me. I got them from the florist for my studies. But they're easy to grow in this part of the world. Oh, yes. I forgot you're studying botany now. So what are they? They're calendula flowers. They're part of the Asteraceae family. Is that Latin? Yes, sorry. The Asteraceae family is one of the largest families of flowering plants. It includes over 19,000 species. Only the orchid family is larger. It's also known as the sunflower family or the daisy family. Well, that's easier for me to say. It is, but in botany, we have to learn the Latin names of all the plants. It's actually very useful. Take this calendula, for example. The flowers are edible, and you can make them into teas and tinctures. They have many medicinal properties. But calendula looks a lot like another flower in the Asteraceae family, called marigold, which is poisonous. In fact, some people even call calendula marigold. That's confusing. Right. And if you went to buy the flowers and ask for marigold, you might get one or the other, which wouldn't matter if you just wanted them for decoration. But if you wanted to cook with them or make herbal remedies, you could get into serious trouble. Yes, you could poison someone. That's where the Latin comes in useful. Marigolds are all from the Tagetes genus, so their Latin names all start with that word. There are about 20 species of calendula plants, but their Latin names all contain the word calendula. The species most often used for herbal remedies, the one I have here, is calendula officinalis. It's a lovely name. It sounds quite poetic. Yes, and it tells us a lot about the plant too. Calendula is related to the Latin word for calendar or clock because the flowers bloom almost all year round in the right conditions. Officinalis is a word we often see in plant taxonomy. It means that the plant has a long history of being used in medicine. Lots of common herbs fall into this category. Sage is Salvia officinalis, and rosemary is Rosmarinus officinalis. My mum uses both of those in cooking. I never knew they were medicinal. So are you going to make herbal remedies with your calendula? I don't think so. But after I've studied it and made notes on it, I might make the flowers into a tea. Save a cup for me. I'd like to try it. As long as you're sure they're not marigolds. The 
Asteraceae family is one of the largest families of flowering plants. It includes over 19,000 species. Now, listen how does taxonomy help scientists study or understand the natural world? Why is taxonomy important for the biodiversity, animals and plants? In a particular area, evaluate each other's performance. Taxonomy helps scientists study the natural world because it means they can categorize living things in a way that is universally understandable. This means it's easier to read and understand the work and research of other scientists, and it's easier to collaborate. Yes, and taxonomy also helps scientists understand how different species evolve and adapt, and gives them information about the history of life on our planet. Right, and it's very important for the biodiversity in particular areas of our planet too. With taxonomy, Scientists can identify invasive species that might be causing a problem for local ecosystems. It's necessary for conservation of plant and animal species. We need to identify each species and its needs in order to protect it. Scientists think they've only identified 2 million out of the estimated 10 to 12 million plant and animal species on Earth, though. If they don't hurry, it could be too late for lots of these species as extinctions are occurring at faster rates than ever. That's why taxonomy is so important. We need to classify living things so we can see how and where the worst effects are happening and try to stop them. And in exercise 7, find out what categories of living organisms are included in each group in the linen system of classification below. You can include information about the classification of a living organism. Did you know that over 800,000 of the world's species are estimated to live in Australia and New Zealand? Out of those 800,000, only 30% have been identified and given a scientific name. Scientific names are only made up of an individual name and the genus of the organism. But each named organism also has been classified in all seven categories of the Linnaean system of classification. For example, modern humans like you and I have the taxonomy kingdom, Animalia, Phylum, Chordata, Class, Mammalian, Order, Primates, Family, Hominidae, Genus, Homo, and our unique name, Sapiens, giving us the scientific name, Homo sapiens. The different groups in each category help to classify and define each organism. For example, a new organism found that ingests food, has many cells, and no cell walls is considered to be in the kingdom Animalia. Next, if the animal has a spinal cord, it is considered to be in the phylum Chordata. This continues for each of the seven categories. This method of classifying living organisms helps us group similar organisms together and even analyze any possible ancestral links. In fact, Sir David Attenborough, the famous British broadcaster and naturalist, once said, We cannot understand the natural world without the taxonomic system. <laughs>